cassava production saw a reduction, forcing the people to choose other crops. Rice consumption has seen an increase over the years in Region 9. The hinterland region received a large quantity of rainfall, well distributed, which is considered adequate for successful rice crop. The system of cultivation is described as rain-fed upland. Successful demonstrations and training on rice cultivation was conducted at the quarry village with yields recording up to 30 bags per acre using the GRDB 10 variety. Demonstrations were then proposed for other villages in region nine. Rice has now been proven as an alternate crop for creating employment, food and nutrition security for the people in the region. The cost of production is lower as compared to coastal production with fewer inputs. Although the productivity is lower compared to the coastal areas, this venture is profitable. The cost of rice in region nine is higher since it has to be transported from the coastal areas. From the board, at the board level here, we, we fully support the cultivation of, of rice in Region 9. As I mentioned earlier, it, it was started some years ago and, and Dr. Payman will go into more details as to, to when it was started and where we are now. But we fully support, we fully support uh, rice cultivation in, in Region 9 and the in general, the hinterland areas. Uh, we, that's part of the mandate of the board and we will continue to do that in, in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ratnoff, for those brief comments. So over the past few weeks, we would have had informative sessions coming from our plant breeder on biofortified rice. And just recently, we would have had a presentation from the value added and post harvest department on the potentials of rice flour. Today, you will have the opportunity to learn even more from our agronomist, Dr. Payman, as he joins us in a bit to share quite an interesting presentation on hinterland rice. I think it's perfectly aligned with this year's theme for agriculture as it relates to food security. A brief introduction of Dr. Gatsham Payman. He has been a staff of the Guyana Rice Development Board for more than two decades. He's the head of the agronomy and seed production departments. And he is responsible for the production of approximately 14,000 bags of seeds high quality seeds, I may add, seasonally. He was also instrumental in the unrolling of the decentralized seed program in the different regions, allowing farmers to have readily and easily access to quality seeds. Dr. Payman possesses a wealth of information and experience in the area of rice cultivation from the coastland to the, from the, coastland to the hinterland and is fittingly so the hinterland coordinator for rice there. It is my pleasure to welcome my head of department, Dr. Ganshan Payman, to make his presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Crawford. Welcome everyone to, to my presentation today. Share the screen. So my presentation today is entitled uh, Hinterland Rice Cultivation as we celebrate agriculture month, transforming our food system, achieving food and nutrition security. So in the brief remarks made by the general manager, um, cassava, the, its production in the hinterland region, uh, we have seen a decline in that. And um, this is mainly due to the advent of climate change. And with the frequent, the more frequent and intense rainfall, 
uh, they have seen significant reduction and damages to cassava cultivation. Um, simultaneously, we observe that the, the families in those locations, they consume a lot of rice. And this trend is increasing for the past few seasons. So rice cultivation provides another opportunity for diversification, uh, promoting self-sufficiency and nutrition security in that region. So the population size of region nine is approximately 24,000. And um, from our little research, uh, we, we found that about approximately 200,000 pounds of rice is being transported from the coastal locations to region nine. So when this is total for the year, it's 2.4 million pounds of rice. So that is a lot of rice have to be transported to, to, to meet the nutritional needs of the, of the people in, in region nine and also the, the other uh, hinterland regions. So transportation alone is one of the reasons for the high cost of rice in those locations. And uh, when we compare to region eight, the rice is very, very high in terms of cost, right? So um, this, this presentation basically uh, seek to, to highlight some of the work that we would have done in the past few years in, in region nine and more so in the village of Quarry. So just to give a brief description of hinterland soil, um, it's generally low in fertility. Um, the soil type, the physical soil type there is basically sandy loam to sandy loam clay. And it is generally uh, classified as slightly acidic. So th these soils, th they're basically well drained and there's opportunity for, for if you want to cultivate rice on them, you can make bonds on them or you can leave them unbonded so you can trap uh, rainfall water for its successful uh, growth. And it is also drought prone and usually a sloping type of land, also faced with problems of erosion. And the soils both have physical and very poor physical and chemical properties. So the system of rice cultivation can be classified there as upland rain fed because there are no facilities for irrigation except to basically uh, plant in the period when there is the, the, the highest rainfall. And it is also considered as an aerobic type of cultivation because in these upland areas in a 24 hour day, um, even with the advent of rainfall, there is no accumulation of surface water. So looking at the rainfall pattern and distribution in the hinterland, especially region nine, um, and more so let them, uh, for the entire year, the climatic normal for rainfall in the entire year is about 1300 millimeters of rain. And the main rainy season peaks basically between the months of August, of, of the months of May to August, and this total rainfall approximately a thousand millimeters. So that's a four month uh, period, which basically coincides with the, the life cycle of, of the rice crop. And the amount of rainfall received during that period is sufficient for a successful rice crop. And in addition to the system of cultivation, there it is because of the location and so on and soil type. Uh, the input required is a bit lower or less as compared to the cultivation of rice on, on the coastal areas. So this graph basically explains, um, highlights the, the rainfall distribution, the climatic normal for rainfall in region nine Latem. And here you can see between the months of May and August, within that four months period, most of the rains uh, will, will fall. So, this basically guides us in terms of how we need to schedule our sowing and the generally the, the preparation for going into the, the cultivation of rice in that location. So it means that within the month of April, 
and beginning May, that is when most of the land preparational activities must be completed so that on the onset of rain, which is in from May, the, the sowing will commence and that will carry through the crop because most of our varieties here are between 105 to 120 days duration. So that four, four months period is adequate enough to accommodate a successful rice crop. So in the hinterland region, previous attempts were made for, uh, for rice cultivation and more so um, we had the Mokomoko and quarry rice project. Especially in the Mokomoko area, we had the hinterland rice bean project, which was initiated in 2009. A uh, total of about eight to two acres of rice was cultivated along with 11 acres of, uh, of, of uh, legume, which is the, the regular, uh, what we call the black eye species. Um, the objective there was to enhance food security and self-sufficiency in the hinterland communities. And successfully the forest crop was uh, harvested within the month of September, 2010. Um, there were other projects for rice cultivation in the hinterland and that is the Santa Fe farms. And this farm is located on the, in the northern part of Lurukununi. Uh, they started operations here in 2014. And they, the field size cultivated there was within 300 to 500 acres of upland rice um, during the, the few years that they would have operated. And so far, uh, more than 8,000 tons of cargo rice was exported to Brazil. So even though that we have production going on for rice in the hinterland area, there's market also available neighboring. So my presentation basically focused more on what we would have done in the village of Quarry, Region 9. Uh, we first started there in 2019, where we would have evaluated three rice varieties the G98, Torted Ashri, GRDB15, and GRDB10. And I will go through the, the presentation showing you what we would have done and the results obtained in 2019. And then from that now, we would have scaled up in the year after in 2020, uh, planting a, a larger field. So overall, the main objective of this of this venture is to provide an opportunity for diversification and promoting self-sufficiency, food and nutrition security. So <clears throat> the first thing that we would have done there was um, with, the, with the help of the, the villagers, we would have done what we call the site selection, uh, looking at favorable area that we could cultivate rice. And once we would have done that, the first thing that we do was to conduct training because rice cultivation is, is a new venture to those communities. So training was important. It was very important to get the community on board with us, at least to let them understand the, the system of cultivation, the techniques involved, all the other technical aspects. So this was successfully done. And it is also at this time uh, continuing because training is something that you always have to update with time. So after selecting the, the location, the first thing we had to do was to get rid of the one, two trees that were in those in that selected location, uh, debushing and burning where possible. So the tractor, uh, you see the guy operating the tractor there, he had to do a lot of um clearing up of, of, of the stubbles and bushes and so on. And this was done with the help also of the community. So within two to three of uh, cycles of plowing, we were able to, to get the, the land to the ideal quality, which is uh, very conducive for a successful uh, rice establishment. Um, uh, after finish preparing the land for about three plowings, we use a technique called planking, which is basically a, a long level heavy wood is being dragged behind the tractor to basically uh, level the field. 
removing and shaping the, the high spots down to, to more a more uniform and, and level field as possible as it can be. So as I've said earlier, training was continuous in this in this uh, project because the, it's a new venture to the, the community, the people of those for that community. So the, the field conditions at the time of sowing was dry. As unlike the cultivation method on the coastal area where we have to do puddling in water and sow the field underwater. Um, in the upland condition, after preparing the fields level, we basically uh, broadcast the, the dry seeds. Now, in cases where the rain comes in a bit early and you have to sow those fields, it is preferable to have pre-germinated seeds used as the, the seed for sowing. And we would have used the recommended rate of about 140 pounds per acre. So we, we had both male and female uh, villagers came out. They were participating in, in, the, in, in, in the activity of sowing. Each of them had a, some quantity of seed. They were aligned in equal distance apart and they were showed the technique of how to broadcast seeds on those fields. So after sowing of dry seeds, uh, it will take a few days for them to germinate and establish. Now, if, you're, if we are to broadcast pre-germinated seeds within five to seven days, the, the germination and establishment will complete. So as you've seen in the above photograph there, uh, a, a lush green field. However, if we are to do sowing with dry seeds, the, uh, the germination and establishment process takes a bit longer, approximately 14 to 15 days, because the field will have to be, be moistened, that is for rain to fall, germinate those seeds and then establish themselves. So it, it's, it's, it's a longer uh, time to wait for seeing the field to green off. So as the crop established, these are some photographs here showing um, the, 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 the progress in terms of the stages of the, the field at different days. So at seven days after sowing, you can see the germination process. 18 days after we, we, are, we are seeing a, a enhanced growth, and which is basically the, the appropriate timing for your weed control and then commence your fertilizer application. So, in all, there was a very healthy crop, excellent establishment. With respect to fertilizer application, uh, we basically adopted the technique that we do on the coastal area in the lowland irrigated method by applying three splits of application of fertilizer. A half a bag of urea, TSP, and MOP was applied 21 days. And around 42 days, one bag of urea and 25 pounds of murate of potash was applied. And for encouraging a uniform flowering and green filling, a remaining half a bag per acre urea was applied. So the, the villagers, they also were there in presence looking at the method of broadcasting fertilizers. In terms of crop protection, uh, basically, Broadleaf weeds was the most dominant species observed. And more so because uh, these locations are more dominant. You, you find these types of weed species more dominant. And because it's the forest crop, you will not find so much of, a, of the common weeds that are associated with rice as what we would normally observe on the, the coastal areas. With respect to pest and diseases, not so much was observed as I said again, um, rice is now being introduced into these locations. So you don't have that pressure for pest and disease. Maybe in, in future cultivation, as you continue to plant more and more, the, the, the presence and, and the pressure for pest and diseases may probably uh, increase. So 
after the fertilize after the completing all the fertilization um operations applications the the, the the crop came into flowering and then grain filling and the early dose stage so you can see the uh, the progress of the fields the outlook of the fields during these stages then at maturity harvesting so because this was the fourth season of evaluation we the level of mechanization there is just for land preparation so the harvesting had to be done manually using sickle or what we also call grass knife so the 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 villagers came out in large numbers they assist with the harvesting and the trashing of, of the grains. Then after harvesting and trashing, uh, the grains were put for, for, for sun drying. And as you can see the photographs are very clear. So as I said earlier, the, we had three varieties there. We were evaluating to see which one of them would have been best suited for the quarry location. And from, well, the plot size that we would have established in the forest crop there was quarter acre per variety. So we have the actual yields there of, for tortilla tree, it's approximately six bags, GRW 10, 9.8 bags, GRW 15, 6.87 bags. So we, when you extrapolate those yields to bags per acre, the GRW 10 out yielded the other two varieties. And the yield obtained here is 33 bags per acre. Um, I can tell you this is also in comparison to some of the yields farmers are recording on the coastland locations. So these, the yields obtained are very encourageable. Uh, they're, they're also uh, competitive in the sense that when you work out the economics of it, the farmers will end up with, with a large profit margin. So after the forest evaluation in 2019, we scale up the operations a bit in quarry in 2020, where we cultivated four acres. We cultivated four acres um, in, in quarry village, and we, we move, move forward with the variety GRD 10. And in that season, we harvested uh, a productivity of 27 bags per acre, which is very good. So this table basically gives you a comparison of what basically is being done when you're doing the lowland irrigated rice, which is what we call cultivating on the coastland area, as compared to what we're doing in the upland rain fed in the region nine location. So in terms of land preparation, the primary land preparation is basically the dry land preparation. So it's basically similar for that in both locations. Whereas in the, for the secondary land preparation, which is basically cultivating the land with water and doing puddling, that part is eliminated in the upland condition. You don't have to do puddling. So right away, that's a cost has been um, reduced as compared to the the uh, cost of cultivating compared to the, the lowland irrigated on the coastline. Um, irrigation is totally absent because in a rain-fed condition, all you depend on, on is rainfall. The, in terms of crop protection required, only the, the weeds aspect we had to do. And the productivity that obtained on the coastline is 35 to 40 bags an acre we would have recorded a range between 25 to 30 bags an acre in the rain-fed area. Um, the cost of production here is basically estimated because we, we had no opportunity for mechanical harvesting and so on. So we could not have um, do the, a, a, a more detailed and accurate costing. However, the cost of production lies between 70 to $80,000 per acre on the coastline. Whereas that estimated for the upland rain fed was between 50,000 to 60,000 per acre. So in 2021, the, the current situation for rice in region nine 
we would have increased in the, the acreage and also the number of locations. Presently, we have approximately 20 acres under rice cultivation over a few, about 10 villages there. Uh, these include Shulinap, St. Ignatius, Quarry, Kumu, Karasabai, Shurkidanao, Kaudaru, Achiweb, Aishalton. And there is, there are villagers from other locations that which we have not uh, worked with as yet, who are very much interested in cultivation of rice coming up in the, the, the other season. So we may probably end up with about 15 locations coming up in the, in the next season for rice cultivation. So you can see in the photograph here, we have rice in Shulinab. I think this one would have already harvested this season. We have rice there in Aishaltong. And those in Jawari and Kumu, they were later soon, so they're not in the, the flowering stages yet. But we are making good progress in, in most of these locations. So from our two season work in, in that location, there are some limitations and constraints that we would have faced. Uh, the first and foremost is labor. As I said earlier, the, this, this type of activity is new to that community. So the level of skill for the, the villagers or the farmers involved is not there. So we would have to continue with training, whether skill or unskilled, we will have to continue with training and a lot of awareness program would have to, to, uh, to be planned. Uh, the level of mechanization at for example, in 2020, when, when we did the four acre plot, it took us almost a week to harvest by hand at quarry. Now, we need to go further into mechanization because this will save a lot of time, they'll save a lot of costs and so on. So mechanization in terms of land preparation, harvesting, we will have to, to look into those very shortly. Um, the GRDB has one staff who is basically responsible for all the field work and, and demonstration and training in the region nine location. If we have to scale up now to, to about 15 locations and knowing the, the, the vast expanse of region nine, we will have to have additional staffing to, to cover the, the, the proposed location. And of course, um, the regional support they need to scale up also. So as I've mentioned about mechanization, because we are not doing secondary land preparation, which is basically puddling in water, uh, the machines that we have available for land preparation are the, the basic plow and, and chipper. We need to invest and go for larger size uh, equipment, which is the multiple disharrow, because these disharrow um, will basically bring the soil particle size into smaller sizes in, in, a, in a shorter time or less, less operations as compared to using the displow. Uh, for proper establishment of the field, reduction of weeds and uniform establishment, if we have laser leveling machine, we can able to, to raise our grain yield and to reduce some of the, the weeds problem that we have there. Drill cedar is, is very important and will be recommended because what this does, this place the seeds in parallel rows. Rather than broadcast the seeds uh, and it remain on top of the soil, sometimes you have a uh, board will come and, and, and feed on them. Uh, if you don't have the, the amount of moisture in the soil or, or rainfall, the germination and establishment can be delayed or it can be ununiform. So by doing drill seeding, it's basically placing seeds in rows about a, a few centimeters from the topsoil. So once the seeds are in contact with the soil and the soil has moisture, that itself will germinate the seedling faster and you'll have a more uniform 
and better establishment of, of the seedling. And instead of harvesting manually four acres of rice, we can purchase a small, what we call a mini harvester that has the capacity of about five to six bags when, when the, the, the tank is full. So these will save labor, they will save us time and also give us the opportunity to expand in the, in the locations and the areas, the, the, the acreage for rice cultivation. So some of the future plans that we have there is rice cultivation demonstrations in all the major districts or villages in region nine. Uh, because of the rainfall, distribution and pattern in, in the region nine location, it is recommended that we do one season of rice. Okay, let's say for example, on the coastal area, we have two cups per year. In the region nine location, you have one major rainy season, which is from May to August. So you need to do something there to continue the economic activity of, of the villages. And one of the best thing to do is to rotate rice with legumes because legumes will give them an income. Legumes, the residue from legumes also will enhance the fertility of the soil. And also by plowing in these organic matter into the soil, you're enhancing the organic content, the, the water holding capacity and so on for the, for, for the rice crop. So when you're doing your rice after the legume, your dependence on nitrogen fertilizer and, and other things will be less. And, at the same time, enjoying a, a, a higher green yield. So we also need to enhance collaboration with the Region 9 Agriculture, the RDC. We will have, the current season have seen some, some level of, uh, of collaboration and we need to continue and to expand with that. We need to venture out a, a little bit more in other communities and villages. We need to partner with private individuals because um, we have had requests where private individuals also want to cultivate rice. We need to collaborate with other agencies, for example, NARI. They can assist with us with the rotation with legumes in, in those um, locations. Uh, of course, I've mentioned expanding the, the locations and, and acreage. We need to have collaboration with Emprava from, from Brazil because they are one research agency and seed producing company. Um, our ecosystem for rice in region nine is basically similar to that in the hinterland region. So the technologies developed by Emprava can significantly benefit us rather than have to do more research on our own. We could have technology that we can basically adopt and demonstrate there. There's also a area for research in the future. Um, the variety that we are planting there, we are cultivating in region nine is the variety developed for the coastal locations. Uh, Rain-fed agriculture, rain-fed upland rice requires a shorter duration variety because it can complete its life cycle when adequate rain or moisture is there. And also, these varieties, the, the upland varieties, they're more tolerable to the harsher conditions in terms of um, resistance or tolerance to, to drought or dry conditions. Um, we need to optimize our research in terms of the level of um, nit uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium required and the timing of application. Uh, in terms of our, our agronomy, we need to work a bit more on the land preparational activity, the type of and method of land preparation, the establishment method of the field and some seed density or seed weight. In terms of crop protection, we are already having problem there with, with weeds. Um, I am foreseeing problem with pests and diseases to come up because we are now in the, the, the early stages of cultivation. And as you cultivate a particular area more and more, the tendency for increased pressure for pest and disease will eventually happen. And also uh, the associated weeds that we are accustomed to on the coastlands, those will also be um, observed in those locations. So we need to focus on research. 
So with all these resource and adaptation plan, we will be able to prepare a manual or what you call a package of practice. So the farmer or, or the communities, the villagers, they can follow closely how to cultivate rice in the hinterland region. So thank you very much for your patience. Um, I hope that my presentation gives justice in terms of the awareness and what we are doing in terms of research and cultivation of rice in the hinterland region. As our objective is, is to basically give an opportunity for diversification as cassava and the other crops that are popular in those locations are becoming a threat due to climate change and floods and so on. Um, rice is more suited. It's also creating employment within that region and it will also add to the, the food and nutrition security in keeping with view our team for Agriculture Month 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Payman, for your presentation. I hope it would have whet the appetite of our, some of our viewers and sparked some interest regarding hinterland rice. We learned of its potential and challenges. So if you have any questions, you can do ask them now via the chat section or you can do it live. Mr. Lambert Chester, please go ahead with your question. Uh, good morning, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Payman, for that presentation, which was very informative. There is just one little question I, I, I want to ask. Um, have you considered anything in terms of your land preparation? Would you be considering reduced tillage or anything of that sort up in the Rupununi? Hello? Yes. Um, minimum tillage will, very, will be very much uh, considered. Um, conducting minimum tillage and even zero tillage, right? Those are methods that are very important in sustainable agriculture. They are very important meta, method of cultivation uh, in view of climate change, they also considered very well in terms of reduction in cost of production. The problem is that um, we, if you're starting up with rice in those locations, uh, because of the, the topography and the different vegetation that we, we are observing there, we would have to force establish the crop with the regular method of our land preparation. I'm sure going forward after that, the minimum tillage and the zero tillage method where you just apply glyphosate on the soil to get on the land to get rid of the vegetation. And immediately after that, you pass with your, your zero tillage uh, implement and add your seeds and fertilizers. So we, we are now in the, 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 the starting stage. Uh, we, we intend to expand and we intend to do research and development, and the idea of minimum and zero tillage will be considered. 
Thank you. Thank you for your question, Mr. Chester. The floor is still open for more questions. All right, it seems like we have a shy group. So this is the end of Dr. Freeman's presentation for today. However, before I go, I want to add that Dr. Rajendra Prasad will be presenting on Friday 29th on the management of rice diseases in Guyana. You can tune in for that informative session as well. Also to note, this presentation and the others can be found on GRDB's web page, YouTube, and Facebook pages. Thank you for participating today. Thank you.